okay so now we'll start off with a new chapter which is system simulation so from now on it will get uh, it will get mathematical right everything will get mathematical so we'll be solving lots of problems in the class as i told you before please come to the class with your calculators right now first half an hour we'll just go through some basics and i'll teach you about uh, information flow diagrams which which will be helpful to you in solving of system simulation problems even without that you can solve but things will be more organized particularly if a system is made of several components it is always a good idea to represent each of these as blocks and find out what is the information which is going into the system what is the information which is coming out so that you get an overall idea but i i have seen i have been teaching this for 10 years my iit students don't like to draw all this and so straight away you want to solve that's okay if there are only two or three components are involved but if you have a large system which consists of several components it's always a good idea to do, to do what is called an information flow diagram which i'll discuss in today's class so the mathematics will start from the next class onwards so i'll teach you the method of successive substitution and newton raphson method for single unknown as well as multiple unknowns all right so what is system simulation system simulation is basically a is basically a mimicry or you mimic the system okay you mimic a system it can be defined as a calculation of operating variables such as pressure temperature and flow rates of energy in a thermal or energy system operating in steady state it, i'm sorry this it can also include system operating in steady state and also operating under transient conditions for example a power plant most of the times we are interested in the steady state performance of a power plant but there are also issues like starting up and shutting down of a power plant these are very critical for a nuclear reactor suddenly there is an accident and there is an emergency shutdown you can shut down all the things uh, you can shut down your reactor but this nuclear fission is not going to stop immediately it will continue to the fission reaction will continue to proceed and if all your the all the systems break down you won't have pumps which will take the heat from the fission <coughs> fission reaction and therefore you will not be able to dissip dissipate all the heat ultimately to the ambient so in this case natural convection will take over because pump is not working so you should design a nuclear system such that in the case of an accident in the case of an accident even under natural convection even under natural convection you don't have catastrophic consequences so this is an essential part of this is an essential safety divisions are very very important in nuclear nuclear power plants there are lots of engineers working on safety there is a separate body in india called the atomic energy regulatory board aerb which is actually separate from the which is actually separate from the atomic energy uh, i mean atomic power plants so this is a regulatory body which which uh, which comes and checks in period, periodic intervals of time whether the safe, safety systems are in place okay so as thermal engineers or mechanical engineers while most of the time we are interested in the steady state we are also sometimes interested in the transient a chemical engineer on the other hand is is often times interested often times interested in the transient operation okay so process control process control is big time process control is a big deal in chemical engineering process control is not a big deal in you are you are just learning one course in controls right instrumentation and control how much of control did you study in that course huh it's mostly on instrumentation is it okay so control will also involve some stability analysis and all that so for suppose you give a disturbance to a system whether it non linearly grows or decays with time so this is essentially what is called as a stability analysis and so on so chemical engineers are often interested in this but uh, mechanical engineers somehow we do not concentrate much of course needless to say in this course we will concentrate only on steady state but i want you to remember that transients are also important the definition which i have given above basically we want to calculate so just like in the previous example you, we actually calculated the we actually figured out the diameter the diameter of the pipe as well as the rating for the pump we should be able to calculate all the operating variables so it could be possible that you actually have a heat exchanger and you want to work out the outlet temperatures of the fluids and so on that is basically i am talking about an analysis problem the design problem is given all these flow rates and all that what will be the heat exchanger size how many number of tubes and so on so i already explained to you the difference between the analysis problem and the design problem so simulation is more concerned with the design i will concerned with the analysis rather than the design 
So this is, this definition is basically for a thermal system. So therefore, for us to do system simulation, we need to know the perform performance characteristics of all com components, and we need to know the equations for the thermodynamic properties of the working substances. Thermodynamic. So we are not going to work with air always. It is very beautiful, very easy to work with air and water. That way, your whole thermodynamics there are only two fluids. In your ME one ten, we taught you only two fluids. Now it's ME eleven hundred. Air, so P is equal to rho R D and all that. Simply keep on doing this, no problem. Other one, you use the steam tables. Okay. Anything beyond that, we have not taught you in thermodynamics. But however, new fluids are constantly coming up. Refrigerants they are because of Montreal Protocol, people are changing, moving away from CFCs and so on. Who will give us the properties of all this? So there should be groups of scientists or engineers who are constantly at it, who are who are using equipment, who are developing equipment to measure all these properties and give us in the form of handbooks or charts or in the form of CDs or post it on the internet or whatever. Now, in order to do system simulation, it is not possible to use tables. I ask you to do simulation, you take. You know, 100 bar 400 degree centigrade when will you complete the work so what do you need <coughs> properties must be in the form of in the form of equations you need to have equations therefore regression is required for this so you need to be good in statistics if the prop if if for example the enthalpy is given as a function of pressure and temperature can you construct can you construct equations of y as a function of x1 and x2 where x1 is y is enthalpy x1 is pressure x2 is temperature so y as a function of x x1 x2 enthalpy entropy all this then change of phase hfg right that is latent heat now all these things you should be you, you should be comfortable in converting all the whatever information you have put them in the form of mathematical equations similarly if i know if i know the if i if I know the operating variables of a compressor or a blower whatever I should be able to calculate the efficiency in terms of these operating variables. Therefore, a knowledge of regression a knowledge of how to represent the properties or a system performance in terms of equations is inherent this information has got to be embedded uh, otherwise you will not be able to do simulation. Therefore, after we after do going through the simulation for a few classes, we will get back to regression and I will teach you if you have got y as a function of x1, x2, how do we get this equation. So, some two weeks, two weeks some intensive crash course on regression essentially with a view, essentially with a view to get equations for either the system properties or for getting the performance characteristics of components is, is very much important. Okay. I will teach you some certain things which you have not studied elsewhere. But for my MTech student, there will be some overlap with your measurements course. There will be some repetition, but that, that is unavoidable. But it is very, very important. It is imperative that you, you learn this. Okay. Now, what is the story? The equations for the performance characteristics of the components and the thermodynamic properties, along with mass and energy balance, will constitute a set of simultaneous equations which relate the operating variables. If you solve the system of simultaneous equations you will be able to fix all the operating parameters <coughs> of the system under question this is basically system simulation okay there will be a large there will be a large number of variables so you will have to do matrix operations for large systems however for the classroom environment we will restrict our attention only to two and three variable problems so System simulation is thus a way of thus a way of mimicking the performance of a real system. Instead of trying to do an experiment and trying to find out how the output will change when each of these inputs is changed, you write all these in terms of mathematical equations. So you have a computer model or a mathematical model of your simulation, and you go ahead and do numerical experiments, or you do experiments on the computer, and upfront, even before you design, you get an idea of how the system is performance is changing if the design if the operating variables are changed so that is the goal of that is the goal of system simulation so this simulation is different from another kind of simulation where a system is simulated by observing by observing the performance of another physical system right that is basically called the analog model which you have which you have studied in heat transfer correct 
So, that is one simulation, I am not talking about that for example. Okay, so, so there is a slab with a thickness x, thermal conductivity k, having steady state. So here there is a heat transfer equation of h1 and a free stream temperature of T infinity 1. Here you have a heat transfer equation of h2, it is T infinity 2. So, this situation is typically encountered in heat exchanger application where there is a plate which separates the two fluids. Okay. So, there is a heat transfer from one fluid to the another fluid. Let us say that. So, this plate is bathed, this plate is bathed by a hot fluid on one side and it is bathed by a cold fluid on the other side. So, this plate acts as a mediator for the transfer of heat between from one from one fluid to another fluid, but convection is encountered at the interface between this solid and this fluid and conv convection is also encountered at the interface between this solid and this. Therefore, there is a flow of heat from left to right. Okay, this is the physical problem. Now, it is possible for us because h 1 and h 2 are not equal to infinity, T infinity 1 will not be equal to T 1 and T 2 will not be equal to T infinity. If h were to be infinity, if h 1 were to be infinity, it requires an infinitely infinitesimally small temperature difference to accomplish the heat transfer from the fluid onto the solid. However, since the maximum heat transfer coefficient even under boiling or condensation is only 20,000 watts per meter square or 15,000 watts per meter square Kelvin, watts per meter square per Kelvin, technically it is impossible to have a situation where T 1 will be exactly equal to T infinity 1. Therefore, whenever, whenever there is convection, there is always a resistance. Therefore, we denote it as R convection. Now, because this fellow also does not have an infinite thermal conductivity, it requires a temperature different. Heat, trans, heat will not be transferred unless there is a temperature different. Technically, we say in boiling or condensation, heat will flow with no temperature different, but that is only theory. Then you do not require heat exchanger at all. Q is equal to H A delta T, H is infinite, you can go home by having a heat exchange with 0 area. It is not possible. If, if you were to make the, if you were, are you getting the point, if you were to decrease the delta T, then the A will increase exponentially, the cost will go up, right. So, so you have a R conduction, you again have a R convection. We call it R convection inside, outside, whatever is outside. This is also a model of this system. This is called the electrical analog model. It is the electrical model. That is the flow of heat is analogous to the flow of electricity. I am not talking, what I would try to say is I am not talking about this. <laughs> okay. So, that you talk, we have talked about in ME3170 or whatever. So, an example for this is the electrical analogy for conduction which is called analog model. An example for what? An example for what we are not talking. Okay. All right. Some uses of simulation. At the design stage, simulation is extremely useful in achieving an improved design. You can evaluate alternate design and find out which is better. Point number one. Point number two, it may be applied to an existing system to explore for prospective modification. Existing system you want to improve. Okay. You want to meddle with it and improve then it is possible for you to use simulation. Simulation is usually needed for studying performance, this is a very critical. Simulation is usually is usually needed for studying performance at off design conditions. Why this is very critical is most of the times, most of the times the system is working at off design conditions, because of some, there is a change in some variable or the other. For example, it is working under part load or it, a power plant okay, during the evening time afternoon and all that there will be heavy demand, early morning there will not be demand and so on. Okay. So, there will be a design load, 
but most of the times it is off the design load not consistently above or consistently below are you getting the point. So, how does the system perform under off design conditions is an important question which can be answered if you are if you are able to develop a model and simulate the system. Why are we so much interested in all this because generally for a power plant for for example, if you are to design a heat exchanger or if you are designing air conditioning system for an auditorium air conditioning system for a mall a city center and other things where lot of costs are involved. So, you are trying to simulate and then you are trying to not only simulate you are trying to optimize because these costs are going up no people are taking simulation and optimization little more seriously accompanied by this is the fact that you have got powerful compute computers as well as software programs which can do all these analysis very quickly combine this analysis with an optimization technique and try to arrive at an optimum that is the story. Most thermal systems operate at off design conditions. So, simulation at the design stage itself will be useful to arrive at decisions if several alternatives are available for example, it, it helps you to explore several alternatives for existing system simulation system simulation will be useful to fix that to fix an operational problem or to look at improvements I have already discussed about this. In summary to cut a long story short simulation can be used to evaluate different designs study or behavior under off design condition study the sensitivity of the performance performance of the system to various operating conditions if x 1 to x n if x 1 to x n are your design variables and why is the variable and the question why is the system efficiency or the power output of the plant d y by d x 1 d y by d x 2 okay. mathematics we call it as a Jacobian matrix if you are able to write it in terms of matrix if there are several y's d y y 1 by d x 1 to d y n by d x 1 d y n d x 1 to d y n d x n that Jacobian matrix if you are able to evaluate all the components of that then you can play around you will get an overall idea how things work out for this complicated system ok. Different classes of simulation this only story do not worry I am not going to ask you I have already put this up on the net right did you see it I have already put it up on my this thing assignment 2 also I will put it up. Okay, I think all of you have copies just in case you want to have, have a look at it leisurely you can do that different. So, we will quickly go through this these are all necessary evils whenever you study something you should also learn the background theory, but as is our won't we will start working out problems from the next class. Different class of simulation it can be dynamic or steady state that is transient and steady state in transient the change of operating variables with reference to time you are worried about the transient basically required for a control system to avoid unstable operating conditions. Okay. I have already explained the background to you steady state most often we are interested only in steady state and it is usually applied to large systems. Okay. This is a typical temperature versus time response for a steady state system. So, a power plant even when you even when you start your motor car when you start your bike you start an airplane. Okay. So, <coughs> there will be a startup phase involved the pilot just cannot uh, right first he will close the doors unless he closes the doors he cannot start the engine you know that first he has to close close the doors and then he will start the engine one by one he will start the engine right engine left engine then you will raise the throttle full throttle he will go he will reduce the throttle he will see whether the sounds everything are okay he will flap his wings up and down all these are mandatory just before takeoff something happens in between he cannot do but at least <laughs> But at least before, <laughs> at least before taking off, he has to. He'll check all. He'll check all. There'll be, there'll be humongous number of uh, this thing on his display. He'll get the latest radar, radar this thing. Now they all have internet. All these modern planes have internet. He can look at all weather maps while in while the plane is in motion. Of course, he has a very powerful radar where he can he can actually do this. Plus or minus twenty degrees, he can go and then here this radar has up to 120 kilometers you can see up to 120 kilometers you can see and then up to here I think 60 degrees or 70 degrees left side 70 degrees right. So, you can you can do a lot of things the only danger is sometimes there is a micro burst or suddenly there is a up, uh, up draft and a down draft which cannot be detected by radar that is called clean air turbulence then he is in trouble. So, otherwise 
he has to go through this first he will start the engine he will look at uh, this thing and then once he gets on to the main runway he has to do it systematically then he will have two or three levels and then at full throttle at full throttle he will do the take off after that <laughs> the wheels have to go in again if they do not go in he is in trouble because what happens the drag you know increases enormously right. So, that is the beauty look at the wheels. So, they are hydraulically operated ok you should be able to deploy them whenever he wants you should be able to retract them whenever he wants. So, the transients all these things there is a protocol right. So, again approach that when, when he lands again 20 minutes before he has to and then there is a particular sequence there is a particular sequence he has to follow because other planes are also flying and uh, there is a particular descent rate because he is already flying at Mach number 0 0.85 or 0 0.9 if he touches Mach number 1 then the centrifugal stresses are mv squared by r then it will be enormously increase the gas turbine will cup ok that is that is what have may be happened to AF 447. If he increases Mach number if, uh, beyond, beyond 1 the engine will work, but the uh, plane may get blown up because the stresses will be too much. So, transients are very important ok in a power plant you just start or a nuclear power plant. So, there will be a stage where you start whether there is a startup then it reaches steady state and then there is a shutdown okay, there is a shutdown could be for maintenance or breakdown or whatever. Now, in this course mostly we are focusing on the steady state if you want transient then it cannot be done in the first level course you have to learn it separately or you take process control chemical engineering. Hmm. Simulation can be deterministic or stochastic several cases are possible there are several cases possible where input conditions are not known precisely and the probability distribution may be given instead with a dominant frequency and average and an amplitude of variation ok. So, then then you cannot use a deterministic simulation. So, then you have to do a stochastic simulation suppose you are for example, you are uh, going to do your MBA or you are going to do a PhD in management or for example, they all these guys also do simulation ok they do what is called a Monte Carlo simulation. Let us say there is a there is a big uh, the, ga the gastroenterology department of a big corporate hospital ok it is hiring a consultant to do simulation to find out the optimum deployment of its uh, OTs uh, OT is operation theater. Uh, uh, so, if it has 3 or 4 OTs so it wants to optimally deploy for example, the bypass surgery and the kidney transplant may take long time whereas, a gallbladder removal may take 2 or 3 hours only. So, it wants to study then what are the various steps involved for example, a bypass surgery patient is first wheeled in ok then anesthetist moves in then they make measurements ok mostly surgery is engineering no mechanical engineering mostly it is cutting and <laughs> there is <laughs> there is heavy engineering in orthopedics also there is too much engineering actually surgery is mostly engineering then they make measurements they hopefully they remember the heart is on the left hand side. Right. <laughs> then uh, the junior doctor will make the measurements they will take his x ray they will take his x ray and the echocardio echocardiogram report and then they will identify what is the size and all that and then he will make the primary this thing for where to cut and all that. And then the main surgeon will come and then they will anesthetist will monitor how the uh, this thing patient is responding then he will start the surgery then they will cut and then I'll put it onto the heart lung machine or nowadays it's called uh, what is it mm. beating heart surgery the heart keeps beating the heart keeps beating and they do the surgery uh, online surgery whatever and then <laughs> <laughs> so it is the heart is not stopped the heart is technically not stopped stopped and no artificial heart lung machine then he closes and and then he is put in a recovery room to see whether it's stabilized and then is taken to the ICU and so on. Now, each of this for example, you can have a Gaussian distribution the normal time taken by anesthetist will be 30 minutes with a sigma of 5 or, five or 8 minutes. The normal time taken for a uh, for a bypass operation which fellow has got 3 blocks ok it is called TVD triple vessel disease. So, triple will be 3 hours for the surgeon plus a sigma of 18 minutes then for the anesthetist to uh, anesthesia to wear off all this. Now, suppose you want to do a Monte Carlo simulation you will generate random number ok random number 44 random number 44 means you will say that if it is between 0 to 50 then the anesthetist will do 
exactly at uh, mean plus gamma if it is f f between 50 to 70 you will take mean minus gamma if the number is between 70 to 90 you pre assign like that you come out with the model and using uh, sequential random numbers you add up all this and find out what is the total uh, total number total time which is taken so let us say the total time is 218 minutes you can run this monte carlo simulation several time if you take an average and then take the variance then that will give you an idea of what is the overall monte carlo simulation of a bypass surgery in apollo hospital that information you can have like that if you do for everything a monte carlo simulation then what is the optimal what is the total time taken in a day how many operations can you schedule and all this or the average time corporate hotels are interested in the average time taken by a guest when he enters the hotel between the time he enters the hotel and the time he actually enters the hotel room how much time is taken can we optimize on this how much time is taken for check out these are also related to queuing theory and all that in OR and so in all these cases it is not known we cannot say that all surgeons will exactly finish in two and a half hours they may have some unexpected thing they will find something new okay so this <laughs> it happened <laughs> they may find somebody is heartless <laughs> That can that can be found only in MRI scan or whatever. No, <laughs> heartless means different, something different. Okay, so these are data. So this is basically not deterministic. This is stochastic, because we don't know. The variables can be the variables can change with time. In a deterministic simulation, all the things are known a priori with certainty. The conditions may also be completely random with an e equal probability. That's what I explained now in this so, so called uh, example when for example another example could be when dealing with consumer demands for power uh, a stochastic description is better than a deterministic description so i already gave you a 101 course on monte carlo simulation now so useful simulation method is the monte carlo method we use it in heat transfer in our group we use the monte carlo method to solve inverse heat transfer problems the monte carlo method uses the randomness of the process along with the the randomness of the process along with the given probability distribution to simulate the system and to get the average output and other characteristics. <coughs> I explained in the last 5 minutes or so how to get the average time for a surgery and all that you can use Monte Carlo method. Okay. You can have a continuous and discrete simulation most of often times in thermal systems we have a we are interested in the continual opera, continuous operations of power plant, AC systems, IC engines and so on. The flow of fluid is con assumed to be continuous. We do not encounter this discrete kind of sy system. These discrete kind of systems are encountered in manufacturing, right? Some there is a batch mode and so on, right? So, whenever discrete pieces such as bearings, fasteners, and gears undergo a thermal process, simulation focuses on a finite number of such items. Simulation of discrete, discrete system is of particular relevance to manufacturing and involves consideration of individual items as they go through a given process. information flow diagram okay the information flow diagram is a pictorial way of representing the representing the uh, performance re representing all the information which is required for simulating the overall system by looking at the by looking at the information pertinent to a particular component right now this is best uh, we will i want to close this represented by a block the information flow diagram is supposed to tell you what are the inputs to this block what are the outputs from this block what is the equation governing this component that is the information flow diagram now for a typical heat, heat exchanger can you take a guess on what are the inputs and what the inputs are and what the outputs are you already saw it there but Hopefully, you did not read it carefully. So, H x heat exchanger, two fluids are involved. Now, tell me mathematically flow rate, flow rate. Uh, be more specific. Uh, okay. The inputs to the in so now we are looking at the information flow diagram of a heat exchanger m dot hot. Then Yeah. 
what will be the output? T hot in T. I do not have to put T cold out because he is already fixed. How? He is already fixed by energy balance. Okay. So, the information flow diagram is succinct, concise and precise. We do not say more than what is required. Okay. What is the equation for the equipment? Okay, you are saying this now F of M hot T hot in M cold T cold in T hot out equal to 0. This is a general generic depiction or a description of the equation for the equipment. Can you get more specific for this equipment since you all studied heat transfer what will be the F for this? What is the equation connecting all these variables? Energy balance alone will not help man, this you are designing heat transfer equipment. Hit the please hit the bull's eye, what is the equation? Q A? Huh? No. Hmm? Hmm. This is one equation. Then from energy balance, So, so F equal to, so you can write the equation as F equal to Q minus U A L M T D F equal to 0. So, if you actually do the system simulation, the goal of your system simulation is to make F 0 numerically or as close as 0 to possible. You will stop iterations when F reaches 10 to the, 10 to the minus 3 or minus 4 or minus 5. Are you getting this point? Okay. Now, compressor. Please think for 2 minutes and tell me, incoming arrows, outgoing arrows, leave the equa equation, we will write F of and leave it, compressor, only one fluid is involved, air compressor, mass and correct, good, mass and pressure, so M dot P1. I need not put two arrows m dot because the same m is coming out. Na? Why unnecessarily waste more arrows? You are getting the point? Ah, what will come out? P2, that is it, good. Got the point. So, power equal to? M dot? Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Compressor in the last portion of the board is not visible to them. Okay, M dot. Are you doing steady state or unsteady?
So, f of so I can just say f of m dot p 1 p 2 equal to 0. What is that f of? Did I make a mistake? Is it fine? You have a doubt, something is bothering you. Vinay, what is bothering you? You, you feel free, ask me. P2 fixed, yeah, we want to fix P2, right? We want to know the, we want to. P2 is fixed, right? M dot, no, I want, I suppose I give different powers. What, what is the maximum P2 I can get? Suppose I am looking at something like that. So, and efficiency is also there. Okay. Now, this is basically one component system. There is no fun in this. All this you have studied, either in turbo machinery and thermodynamics and all that. Please draw the information flow diagram for a vapor compression refrigeration system. Question Please draw the information flow diagram for a vapor compression refrigeration system. Okay. So, we will close with this example. Please, so the question is draw an information flow diagram for a vapor compression refrigeration system. So, the first part of the story is represent the vapor compression refrigeration system on a TS diagram. Identify the various processes and the components associated with each of these processes. Represent each of these components in a box and find out what is the link between the box that is what is coming in and what is going out. The output of one component will become the input of some other component and this is called a sequential simulation because everything is going in one cycle. Okay. Are you getting the point? Turbine compressor this evaporator and so it forms a, so this is called a sequential, this is called a sequential arrangement. Please go ahead, I will give you 5 minutes, please draw the TS diagram. And you do not have to worry too much of the about the equation, you can just put f1, f2, f3, f4. Okay. So, what is this called? Superheat on. on. So, I will quickly explain the cycle. I told you modeling in the syllabus when I gave you the course content I said modeling. So, to the extent required for this course I will teach you modeling 
in between. So, I already told you little bit about pump, compressor and so on. So, I will explain, I will give you a 3 minute course on vapor compression refrigeration system. So, you start from point 1, point 1 is a fully saturated vapor, 100 percent vapor, no liquid. So, let us assume isentropic compression, it is its pressure and temperature are increased, its temperature is such that its temp, the, the temperature is the temperature is raised to a level at which it is possible for you to condense that is it is at a temperature greater than the surroundings okay now there is a de, de superheating which takes place then it becomes a fully saturated then it becomes a fully saturated vapor then it is condensed please remember the 2 2 dash 3 are taking place at the same pressure okay now it becomes a it becomes a fully saturated liquid okay refrigerant then it is throttled throttled is an isent so 1 2 2 2 dash d superheating Four one is evaporation. So it is an isenthalpic process. The basic job of this throttling is to ensure that the pressure is decreased. When the pressure decreases, automatically the temperature also decreases. Here, okay, the temperature decreases. Now, it is a it is a mixture of a liquid and vapor, which is at four. Since throttling is an irreversible process, okay, you cannot take it from 4 to 3, 4 to 3 is so difficult because it is it is impossible to design a pump which will accomplish this objective. Because it is impossible to do in a Rankine cycle, we take it all the way here and then do this, right? You remember the Rankine cycle, okay. So, 4 now you have got a cold refrigerant, it first enters the it enters the uh, in the so for, for example if it is uh, this can be used both for refrigeration and air conditioning if it is a refrigerator first it will enter the deep freezer okay it will enter the deep freezer then it will go to the chiller and uh, milk chilling and uh, places and all that and then it will come to the place where you keep the vegetables and fruits and all that it picks up the heat it collects the heat from the food stuff okay takes all the heat and vaporizes and comes to state 1 and the cycle is repeated. So, the whole thing we have an anti clockwise operation whenever there is an anti clockwise operation there is an it is a net work absorbing cycle it is a reverse heat engine. And its performance is is can be stated in terms of the coefficient of performance. The coefficient of performance is refrigerating effect so for 1 kg can you tell me in terms of enthalpies. Okay, invariably the COP is greater than one. Okay, so the COP Carnot will be. Correct. Will be COP of heat engine operating between. So let's say this is. I don't know. You have to call it as 
T high and T H and T L. One minus okay. Now we have to draw the information flow diagram for this. Is this clear? Okay. If we reverse the arrows, if we reverse the direction of the arrows, you get a you get a Rankine cycle power plant. Correct. If you so the Rankine cycle power plant will be like this. So if you do this, if you do this, it will be an extremely wet. It will be an extremely wet mixture at the end of the at the end of the expansion more than if it is less than 88 percent it will cause it will cause erosion of the blades therefore we superheat it and bring it okay now it is possible for you it is also possible for you to do this so this is basically reheat so you can have reheat you can have reheat regenerative cycle and so on okay so these are all complicated versions of the more complicated more complex versions of the Rankine cycle power plant. So, basically the idea is you have got to do this because nobody invented a pump to do this okay. and some, some people may be having an idea why cannot we do like this what will be the pressure here. Then if this produces x, this will be 1.5 x or something. Okay, so sometimes you have like this. What is this? Supercritical. So in the in the tube itself, the water directly becomes steam. The funda here is the efficiency. The efficiency is a strong function of two temperatures. One temperature is the heat at which the the temperature at which the heat is rejected, and the temperature at which the heat is added. The temperature at which the heat is rejected is not under your control because it is basically the ambient. But the temperature at which the heat can be added is under your control, subject to whatever is allowed by material scientists. Therefore, all these cycles basically the funda is they exploit this and they try to increase the mean temperature of heat addition. Okay. So, the mean temperature at which the heat is added if it is increased then the efficiency will increase all right. So, so compressor, condenser, throttle valve evaporator and it comes back right. M dot I have no T 1 will not work here. Huh? Okay, H one. Okay, H two. H three. H three. Good. H. That's it. So here the equation will be F one of M dot H one. There is no big design of this equipment, right? Oh. Sorry. 
sorry. So, this is called a sequential arrangement. The output of one becomes the input to the other. Any problem? Yeah, some people do not like H4. If you want to be threateningly formal, you can still use H3. Okay. So, this is a sequential arrangement where the output from one component becomes the input to the other component, everything is linked. Now, if you know all these equations, these equations can come from the manufacturer, or if you have got data for various values of what is the performance curve and all that, if you know F1, F2, F3, F4, you can write, you can put all these together, write your script and simulate this vapor compression cycle on your MATLAB. Provided if you provided you know the properties enthalpies at all temperatures and pressures, and then you can start start playing with the variables and try to find out when your system is working well and all this, and then you can define an objective function cost and optimize and so on. So you can use Simulink tool of MATLAB, which can be used to simulate more than one component. So if you are doing your BTEC project, MTEC project, MS or PhD in system system design and system design analysis or optimization. I, I encourage you to learn the Simulink. Okay, there is also something called Modelica. Modelica software also does all this. Okay, I'll stop here.